The Read to Lead Podcast, Episode 104. Hello, I'm Dixie Gillespie, author of Just Blow It Up, Firepower for Living an Unlimited Life. You'll find plenty of firepower in here. It's the Read to Lead Podcast with my friend, Jeff Brown. If you have a hard time connecting and going deep with people, then I would ask why. Because when you bond with somebody and go deep, it does something emotionally, psychologically, spiritually to that person. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable features feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now here's Jeff. Hi there and welcome to the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth where the topic of leadership is always central to our conversation. But we also dig into things like personal development, productivity, career, business, marketing and entrepreneurship. In today's episode, we will be chatting with Jeremy Kubitschek, co-author of Five Years, How to Be Present and Productive When There Is Never Enough Time. Among other things, I'm going to be asking Jeremy why leading well is similar to driving well and how to apply the five-gear analogy, the differences between understanding the various gears at home versus at work, the importance of being able to recognize when a shift is appropriate or necessary, and much, much more. I want you to know I've officially published my 2015 listener survey. And if you'd be willing to take the survey, it would be extremely helpful to me and to you. It's going to help me better understand what kind of content and maybe even products or services uh, would be most helpful to you going forward in 2016 should be able to complete the survey in about 10 to 15 minutes. Two ways you can take the survey, just visit readtoleadpodcast.com slash survey from anywhere in the world or in the United States, text RTL survey, all one phrase, RTL for read to lead survey to 33444 and I'll send you a link to take the survey right from your mobile device. Again, that's RTL survey to 33444 if you live in the lower 48. Jeremy Kubitschek is co-founder of Giant Worldwide and the Giant Companies. He is a best-selling author of Making Your Leadership Come Alive and speaker to organizations throughout the world on transformational leadership, emotional intelligence, and personal growth. Three issues near and dear to my heart for sure. Jeremy is also the author of the book we're talking about today, of course, Five Gears, How to Be Present and Productive When There is Never Enough Time. Jeremy, welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. Oh, so good to be with you, Jeff. Thank you for the time. Uh, before we get into the uh, the solutions that the book lays out and connecting more deeply with, with others and increasing our influence and our leadership abilities and that sort of thing, I thought it would be great uh, to do exactly what you lay out in the book, and that's explore uh, some of these powerful questions you pose early on in the book to sort of kind of get us in that mode of uh, evaluation, self-evaluation. That would be great. Let's do it. Well, uh, we don't have time to cover all 13 of them, but uh, what are some of these, these, these probing questions that you pose, and, and why is it important to, to ask these of ourselves? Well, you know, you think about, um, most people think of leadership, they think of IQ. Um, I look at, at leadership and I think of emotional intelligence, meaning mm-hmm. that most people get to the, where they are because of their pedigree or their upbringing, but they, they stay with where they're at because of their ability to connect with people. And emotional intelligence and social connectivity is usually what will undermine a leader or a person, whether it's uh, disconnections from their spouse and their kids that lead to some divorce or some disgruntled life or uh, issues with with coworkers or with their boss or with a board or what have you. And it's usually, it's always called fluff. (laughs) And, And what we found is it's actually the hardest skill to produce. It's Mm. relational and emotional intelligence. Well, Jeremy says that leading well is similar uh, to driving well. You'll be jealous to to hear uh, his first car story, as I was. (laughs) Jeremy, unpack the the gear analogy for us, if you would. Yeah, the the whole idea of this came when my my business partner and I were trying to figure out how to explain what we saw in each other's life. Mm. And we were trying to create a metaphor. And 
uh, the best I could come up with, up with was a stick shift. Well, at the time, I was living in London, and my, my business partner and co-author is Steve Cockrum. So in London, you know, they have a obviously drive on the other side, <laughs> and your steering wheel's on the other side. So think about where your gear shift is. You've got mm. a left-handed stick shift. Mm. All of a sudden, I felt like I was 16 again because I'm, <laughs> I'm grinding gears, I'm lurching, I'm trying to figure out how to get in reverse, and all of these things. And it just made it was just a perfect metaphor to go. You know what? We need all the gears, but a, a manual stick shift. Most of us live manually, where we're shifting and we're grinding gears. And our emotional intelligence is not automatic. And so to understand that we need to shift to the right gear at the right time really allowed me to have a good metaphor to, to share what I was seeing and vice versa. We were seeing in each other's lives. Yeah, I opened the uh, the door wide, too, for you to share what that first car was, but you didn't you didn't take me up on it. <laughs> you know, it's a 1972 Alfa Romeo. It was a James Bond car. And it was so yeah. sweet. It was so great. Um, but, you know, it's hard... It's hard to find Alfa Romeo parts in Oklahoma, and uh, so it was very expensive to maintain as a young 16, 18-year-old. Oh, I, I can't imagine. My, my first was a, a 1966 Ford Mustang, and I will always uh, think fondly on that car. Absolutely. Uh, well, I want to dig into a few of, of the gears more uh, specifically. We won't necessarily have time to get into all of them. Uh, we'll wait and see here, but, but, but first give us a brief overview of each one, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll do it in record time. Fifth gear. <laughs> Fifth gear is focus mode. That's when you're in the zone. You're working on a project. Uh, you're by yourself usually, uh, whether it's in front of a computer, it's in your garden, it's working on a car, whatever, but you're just focused and fixated on that. Fourth gear is multitasking, so it's task mode. So you're working on uh, emails, phone calls, to-do lists. You've got meetings, inter- interviews. It, it, your day is just kind of rambling through all types of things as you spin plates. Uh, third gear is social mode. Mm. It's the mode where um, it, we're in when we're at the church foyer, we're at the golf course, we're at a barbecue with friends, we're at dinner date with another couple. Uh, it, it's, it's casual, small talk, vacation, kids, weather, sports, uh, chit-chat, mm. um, all the things that we, we normally think of in that uh, uh, mode. And then the second gear is connect mode. It's when you're, in the, you're, you're really bonding with someone. You're not talking about work. It might be a date. It might be a um, time with a, a, a kid, uh, one of your children. It might be a, a coffee with a good friend. And you're going deeper into life, into work, into everything uh, outside of work, typically, or, or at least deeper levels. And then first gear is recharge. So it's how you recharge. Each one of us recharges differently. If you're an introvert, it's different than an extrovert. So it might be rest, workout, exercise, walks, reading, um, devotionals, whatever it is for each individual. Mm. And then re- lastly, it's reverse, which is there's five gears plus reverse. I know it's a sixth gear, but uh, <laughs> reverse is really learning how to back up. It's learning how to apologize. So the whole goal of being responsive, not resistant. And it's really important that most adults are not very responsive that we found. So those, that's the five gears metaphor. Well, let's go back to let's start with fifth gear and kind of work our way through a couple of these and talk about getting into to overdrive, the correlation between overdrive, Jeremy, and our personal fifth gear. When you think about uh, fifth gear, when you're really hyper focused, um, you might be working on something. So, you know, when I'm writing the books, I go into overdrive. I, just, I get fixated. I block time out. I, I turn everything off and I just go to town and I look up and it's been three hours. And I'm <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Where did the time go? So on one hand, when you're in fifth gear and it's healthy, uh, then what happens is time usually flies by. You feel really productive. You're in the zone. You're you're very efficient and and very fast. Uh, Sometimes, though, people can get into a fourth gear overdrive, which is like uh, to-do lists and tasks, but it might be unhealthy. Mm. And so there's there's a culmination of unhealthy and healthy, and it's really important to understand if it is healthy. For fifth gear people, some most of the time it's introverts that are really good at being in fifth mm-hmm. gear. And uh, so what, what happens though over time is that they can actually do too much fifth gear where they might take every meal in front of their computer and they start checking out of any third gear social times. So people start not well making fun of them, calling them names, you know, giving them like, oh, hey, hey the, hob- the, the recluse came out. Who's the hermit today? You know, <laughs> things like that. And so it's really important that you put a boundary, a start and stop time, because fifth gear can get really addictive. 
And you can actually become unproductive over time, even though you feel productive in the beginning. And I think a key point is, is that there is a good side to bad side, uh, potentially, uh, to each one of these, right? We can abuse them as well as leverage them. Yeah, absolutely. And most people don't understand, like, for instance, first gear recharge. Um, well, uh, crashing is not recharging. <laughs> like, crashing is crashing. Mm. And so a lot of adults will go really hard in fifth gear, really, really hard, and then they'll pull off and crash into first gear. That's not a sustainable lifestyle. Mm. And so what we, what we realize is that it'd be like having a car and the only two gears you use are first and fifth. You know, you can't really get there. It doesn't really work for everyday driving. So what we tell people is you have to learn how to use the other gears. And when you mm. get proficient in the gears, your emotional intelligence will improve and your influence will rise. Well, Jeremy, what are some practical ways that, that you can give us to help us teach others how to, how to utilize fifth gear specifically? Well, um, practical ways would put it on your calendar. Block times off mm. to say, hey, you know what, guys? This is my fifth gear time. I've got to get this project done. And when I'm in fifth gear, it benefits everybody. Um, but there's a start and stop on it. Check in with me at 4 o'clock. I should be finished at that point. Uh, another thing we do is we have people like at Ford Motor Company, they put uh, fifth gear on their windows, or their doors, of their office. Mm. So if they're in fifth gear, people know it because they have a little laminated card they put in the corner. So it says five. <laughs> so so it's, a, it's a sign language. And what we found is the sign language works at home or at work. You just use your fingers to call plays. Like hold up five fingers and all of a sudden people understand, hey, yeah, he's getting in the zone good. That's awesome. We, you know, it's great when he's hmm. or she is getting things done. I really was fascinated to read about how you uh, implement this uh, at home as well, even with, uh, I think it was your, uh, th- was it your three-year-old daughter? I think it was a uh, 13 year old. Thirteen. So I've, <laughs> I've got three teenagers. Yeah. Now we do, we do have a story in there. I was at uh, college station, Texas, and I was with the family and I went in and they had taught their, their kids the tools. And I go in and I just I said, all right, let's do a test. And I'd hold up three. What does three mean? And the little girl was like, well, that's recess. That's social mode. (laughs) That's when I'm in the, you know, and she explained, and they explained the gears. So the beauty is um, with the gears metaphor, it's not, it's objective language, not subjective. So subjective might say like, Jeff, you know, every time I'm around you, you're always on their phone. You're always working. And I feel like I want to, well, that kind of becomes naggy and a little bit judgmental. Where instead, if I just say, hey, Jeff, whoa, we're in second gear, then you have to adjust objectively to go, yeah. hey, you know what? They're right. I'm in, yeah, I'm in the wrong gear. Mm. And that's the secret of the five gears. And I think it's why it's, it's working so well nationally and even internationally. In Europe, we're starting to really pick up a lot of, uh, on the five gears because it, it's a language that we all know. It makes a lot more sense and it feels less judgmental. Well, fourth gear, as Jeremy said, is the, is the task mode. I'd be curious to, to hear from you, Jeremy, some of the nuances between fourth gear at home and fourth gear at work. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, we have a lot of, especially females, who um, there's a, a social ought and should for the female, mm. uh, who, especially moms, because there's a certain thing. They're responsible for dinners, cleaning, kids, uh, you know, uh, laundry, all of those things. And so what happens a lot to the female, especially female professionals or workers, they, they come at work and then they come home, they're in a fourth gear all day and then they come home and it's a different fourth gear. It's like they got in a different car and they're still driving in fourth gear. Mm. And so they have a hard time often getting into a second gear and they really need their spouse to really help with being intentional in the other gears. Um, so I just found that fourth gear can become habitual too. So it's a habit. So to just, just always being on feeling like you have something that you need to do that, that feeling sometimes just causes people to not settle or not be present and then not really be at peace. And so they stayed stirred up all the time. Mm. Well, third gear again is the social gear, but Jeremy, how can, how can this gear help us actually increase our, our influence? Well, I, I say in this book, and, and I make the case that all business happens in third gear. Mm. And you've got two types of people. Um, you've got introverts who are very shy, and they don't like the social space with <laughs> other people. So they would rather go straight to second gear when they see people and get into a corner with someone and just go deep. But the reality is that people need to try you on. They need to actually see 
do they like you or not? Mm-hmm. So third gear is the chance for all of us to try each other on to go, hey, how's it going? Good, good to me. And we get to know one another whether we want to go deeper or further and have a, a deeper conversation. The other end of the spectrum is the usually guys um, who think third gear is a waste of time because mm. they're like, man, I don't want to talk about the weather or sports. <laughs> really, I'm, I've got – so they stay in fourth and fifth gear. But what they, what they don't realize is they actually undermine their influence because they, they're mm. almost sabotaging themselves because they've already tainted themselves as too good for everyone else or um, kind of snooty or a bore. And so people make a judgment based on their uh, action in third gear, whether they want to be around them or not. Well, you talked a little bit earlier about uh, the importance of recharging. That's first gear. But we haven't spent much time uh, up till now on connecting deeply. That's gear two. Share a little bit more detail uh, about that one for us. Yeah, you know, it's it, second gear is really, it's either really easy or really mm-hmm. hard for people. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so, um, you know, some people are like, I don't know what to talk about or I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to go deep with certain people. And and there are some people who are so good at it that they put pressure on other people. I have one friend who is always wanting to go to second gear. But he didn't understand that third gear was the place to get people to warm up. And if you just jump into second gear, you can actually push people away. So it's a it's really an art and a science. Uh, if If you have a hard time connecting and going deep with people, then I would ask why. Is it that you don't trust them? Or maybe it's only one person or two people in your life. Well, just put time in your schedule so you do get that time. Because when you bond with somebody and go deep, it does something emotionally, psychologically, spiritually to that person. And it really, really changes their makeup. Um, It's hard to explain. I've just experienced it and I've seen it. And again, most adults um, have, they basically... First and second gear usually gets the brunt. They don't, they don't get in their life, and they get pushed out most of the time. What can you teach us, Jeremy, about, uh, I think the way you put it in the book, is, is, is shifting well, learning, learning how, to, how to transition properly? So the, the whole idea of shifting is just that you, the realization that we need to be in all of the gears in a given point of the day. Mm. But you need to understand what gear everyone is in and shift there appropriately. So what I've done with my family is we've actually worked on our calendar to go, okay, what gear should we be in during the day? So in the morning, in the morning is not a lot. We're not going to go deep in the morning when our kids are getting it to go to school. It's like get them out of the house. Let's you know take off. So my wife and I have different recharge schedules and we have different work schedules. Mm. So, but we, now we know that because we've looked at the calendar together. Um, at the in the evening we do the same thing. So what I've done is I've actually put in trigger points. So I have a marker, and it's a bridge on the way home for me. And when I get to that bridge, I get off the phone. I shift gears in my mind. It's about three, four miles away from my house. Mm. And it enables me to really think, okay, what gear am I in? Am I in second gear? Am I in third gear? Um, What are we doing tonight? And I become intentional, not accidental. So the the whole point of that is to learn how to downshift appropriately before you get into that gear. So when you get to that sp- space, you're in the right gear with the other group of people. So we've done that at work. We do that at home. We just understand what gears we naturally are in, and we work really hard to get our minds there because this is all about mindset. Work-life balance is not about time. It's about where your mind is. And I really appreciate what you had to say in, in that chapter on intentional versus accidental it's really hard, though. You know, most, most of uh, our culture is an accidental culture. Yeah. And so it's always, it's really depend on entertainment is our main thing that we live around. Mm-hmm. And to be intentional can sometimes feel um, funny to certain people because they're just not used to it. But intentional is being proactive, not reactive. Mm. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm today, I'm being intentional with some planning that I'm starting to put in place for 2016. So I've got certain action plans I'm putting in place to, just so that it causes me to think about things I wouldn't naturally think about. Well, I want to uh, ask you some questions, Jeremy, that aren't directly related to the book. Before I do that, is there anything else from the book you want to make sure that we know about? Um, I would just make this case that um, if you'll try putting the sign language of the five gears into your team or into your, um, your, your culture, uh, at home, it's a game changer. And I, I highly recommend that. I, and, and, and the thing I liked about uh, the book, I think as much as anything, is is the real world stories of how these concepts are being applied. 
Yeah, we've had a lot of practice with this. We've spent, we've probably spoken to about six, 7,000 people who've gone through it. So you've got a lot of stories that come through it. Mm-hmm. Well, I know you love to read, and I was wondering if you could name for us a couple of books that you've read either in the past or maybe you're currently going through that have had an impact on you, Jeremy, and, and share why or how they've impacted you as they have. Yeah, well, uh, one I think is really apropos for the season coming up because of the presidential election. It's my favorite book mm. on politics. Uh, personality, character, and leadership in the White House. Hmm. And it analyzes all the presidents, and it guesstimates their personality types, but it talks about their character or lack of character, their health and unhealth. And it's just a brilliant uh, view. I've probably read it three or four times um, just because it's so uh, interesting. Hmm. Uh, another book that's really helpful in uh, the way that I think is called The Culture Code. And I cannot remember. It's a French guy's name. Really funny last name. <laughs> but um, it's The Culture Code. And it really helps people understand um, – uh, marketing and leadership and how they tie in with one another. And, uh, and the last one, I'm, again, I'm rereading. I, I, I tend to find a few books and reread them and really get the <laughs> essence of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Leadership and Self-Deception has been a really helpful uh, uh, read again, which has been around for a long time by the Arbinger Institute. Excellent. Well, well, to those whose lives you've impacted, Jeremy, family, uh, friends, colleagues, uh, clients, at the end of your life, what do you hope to be remembered for the most? You know, I hope um, we have a term that we use. Uh, it's called the liberator, being a liberating leader. And a liberator is someone who fights uh, for the highest possible good in the life of another person. Mm. So I hope that my family and my friends knew that I was fighting for their highest possible good, that I was actually for them more than I was for myself. And uh, that would be the, the hope at the end of life. Well, if I'm not mistaken, you're already working on uh, another book, uh, but I'll ask you to fill in that blank. What's next for you? What are you and your team working on now that, that you're excited about? Yeah, so we've got a team of about 75 people around um, the world, and we're working with companies of all sizes and shapes, and we're trying to change leadership culture by changing the way that people think um, in real simple, scalable terms. So we've got a product called, program called the Five Voices, mm. which we've, we've taken the personality type and we've made it so much simpler so that there's basically five voices. That, it, it, we're helping people learn what it sounds like to be on the other side of you. Mm. And it's really fascinating whether you're a pioneer, a connector, whether you're a, a guardian, a creative, or a nurturer. And I'm really, really excited about that book. It's a great book for teams. It's a great book for groups of people. Well, I'm very intrigued by that. Um, I'll, when the time comes, probably want to twist your arm and ask you to consider coming back on the show to talk about that one. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, for the time. Uh, it was a treat to, to chat with you. I've, I've known of your work for a number of years and have respected you from afar. And so to have you on the show was just a real, real treat for me. Jeff, thank you. Great questions. I so appreciate what you're doing and love to, to jump back on another time. I'd love for you to be able to connect with Jeremy, LinkedIn, Twitter, for example. I've included links to both Jeremy's profiles on the show notes page for this episode, read to lead podcast.com slash one zero four. That'll be easier this time around than trying to spell Jeremy's name for you. Neither his first or last name is a spelling you're likely to remember. So trust me, go to read to lead podcast.com forward slash one zero four. And remember to dedicate a few minutes today to taking the 2015 Read to Lead listener survey. It'll help me help you on into 2016. If you're in the lower 48, simply text RTL survey to 33444 and take it from your mobile device. Otherwise, visit readtoleadpodcast.com slash survey. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you for our next visit on the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. 